Uh, when I was younger, um, I had some things that I had to work through. Everybody has things they have to work through. But I, I thought I would just kind of move past them over time. And some of them are really, really small, like this one thing in particular that I found out I wasn't over because every time somebody would comment on my clothing, I had like this spike of anxiety and shame. It was the weirdest thing, and I had to like think through it, like wondering why that is there. And what I found out is it goes all the way back to this moment in the sixth grade. Sixth grade was a weird year for me. I lost a tooth. Not the natural way, hockey stick to the mouth, right? Some of you are like, I know, I've had dinner with you. (laughs) I've seen it. Uh, Yeah. But sixth grade was also uh, a year where I was starting to kind of like explore my different options and individuality. And one of the ways I did that was, it was the 90s, okay, so just going to lead with that. It was the 90s, and I bought some super baggy jeans, right? And they weren't just baggy jeans. They had, like, woven through the denim, there was, like, this shimmery quality to them. And it's, I'm going to be honest, it's one of the reasons I, like, there were a lot of baggy jeans out there. But there was only one that had this shimmery quality to it, so I thought, I want those. My parents actually bought them for me. We didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of clothes. My mom made some of them. It was the 90s. Did I mention that? So, like, some of these shorts were, like, neon geometric shapes, uh, stuff that, like, the younger generations now are like, do you still have those? Like, we would love. (laughs) Uh, But I got a a pair of store-bought pants, and they were a little bit shimmery, and I wore those things every day. Every day, loved them. Now, these were the kind of pants that you don't get by without somebody noticing that you wear them every day. And so, I, like, I also went to a really small school where everybody saw everything you did. And I remember, and this, the first one was actually a friend. I think, sort of, he also wasn't the nicest to me, so maybe I'm reconsidering that <laughs> relationship right now. But anyway, I remember he, he came up to me one day, and he, he had this, like, scoffing quality to his voice. It really stood out to me. And he was like... didn't you wear those like every day this week? And immediately like I felt so small. I felt super shamed and I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I've crossed a line socially. Like I've crossed a boundary. And so in the moment I'm trying to figure out like what do I do? And so I like, I was very good friends with dishonesty uh, in school and so I just spun it really quick on the spot. And I was like, no, 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 no. I have like five pairs of these. (laughs) I have like five pairs of these same exact jeans, and I've just, like, I've just, those were different jeans. They're just like, they look the same, though. Like, I get where you're coming from, but I felt so small. And what I didn't realize is that it happened a number of, uh, of times that it just kind of like, I internalized it, and I don't know why I processed it the way I did, but it just became a source of shame that if somebody starts commenting on my clothing, like, immediately I'd go back to that point. And I would start feeling that way. And it took some time to work through it. And that's like a really, really small thing. Now, if it happens with the small things, how much more so with the big things? Right? We have this saying in our culture, and and actually I looked into it. One of the first recorded versions of the saying goes back to 300 AD. But today, the version of the saying goes like this, time heals all wounds. Raise your hand if you know that's a load. Yeah, it's a load. It's not true. But we hide behind it. We're like, just let it go on. Or some of us, we even get into this thinking of like, it's okay. I'm just going to like, I'm going to power through. Have you ever been stuck there? Like, yeah, everybody has a hard life. Life is hard. Life isn't fair. Power through it. Right? Some of you grew up in families that that was the saying. Like, just, just power through it. Just press it down. Move past it. Yes, People suck. Life hurts. Get going. Until you get to a moment where somebody presses on it, and they didn't even mean to. And all of those feelings start coming back. And it's in that moment you realize time doesn't heal all wounds. In fact, it just covers them over, and at best we get to this calloused point. And and you know like when you, you have calluses, like there's still something there, but it hasn't fully healed. There's just no feeling. Like you have a callus on your hand, you don't feel there. The same is true when we allow time to try to heal all wounds, but it can't. Some of us have just developed calluses over time. 
And some of us, when that wound is pressed on, we overreact, but some of us shut down. We'd rather feel nothing than too much. Those are really good indicators that you have wounds that time hasn't healed and neither have you. I think at best in our culture, we, we learn how to not let our past bother us, but it comes out at some point. Those moments of betrayal, those moments of trauma, the moments of hurt, the moments of failure, all of those things build up over the course of our lifetime. Some of us have been investing in these wounds in one way or another for decades. But we don't know how to truly get healing. And so we take up the best advice around us and we just move on. We learn how to control our behavior, but inside it feels like death. I have good news for you this morning. God is a God who heals, not just covers up. I want to take us to a story in Scripture this morning in Luke chapter 10. If you are familiar with this story, it's, it's going to be one of those things where you open to it, you look at the passage, and you're like, why are we going here? If you're unfamiliar with it, you probably have, have heard, maybe you're, you're new to church or uh, you're, you're, new, you're new to Scripture or the Bible, you've probably at some point heard the, the phrase, Good Samaritan, being a Good Samaritan. This is the story where that phrase comes from. We're going to pick up on uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 25 and read through verse 37. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. You can follow along up on the screen. We read here, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and... Love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him for dead, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, uh, he went and to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. I've been praying over this story a lot because on the surface we think, well, that just means I'm supposed to go and show love to whoever needs it, right? Yes, it does. But I think if we pay attention, there's a nuance of this story that we really, really need to grab hold of and that I believe God is asking us to pay attention to. We start with a little bit of context. We have a, an expert in the law that stands up to test Jesus. This just means asking him a question. It was actually pretty common in Jesus' times for the teachers, like Jesus was, to have questions asked to them. And some of them were harder questions. Some of them were kind of like this litmus test moment where people wanted to see if the teacher was worth their weight, if they could answer the questions, what kind of a teacher they were. Some people just ask questions for clarifications. What we have here, though, is we have an expert in the law. Now, an expert in the law isn't somebody who's just really good in the legal system of the day. That would have been the Roman legal system. We have here somebody who is proficient and very well learned in the Jewish law. That means the ritualistic practices of worship, 
what it means to follow God according to the Old Testament, what they called the law of Moses. It was the whole list of rules and what happens when one of those rules is violated. The guy who stands up, he's an expert in that. He's incredibly intelligent, and, and he's incredibly intelligent beyond the rest of his peers. And most of the people who would have gone through Jewish school would have had, at the very least, the first five books of the Old Testament memorized. And then another bulk of people had the rest of the Old Testament memorized. They were an oral culture. They didn't just know about it. They could recite it all the way through. But this guy was even one step more detailed he was trusted to interpret what all of that meant. So he stands up. This is the guy you don't want standing up asking you questions. And always, they do stand up and ask you questions. And so this guy stands up and asks Jesus a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The, the word eternal in the original language is about endurance. It's not just a life that lasts for eternity. Jesus isn't just being asked a question about what happens to you when you die. He's being asked a question about an enduring type of life, a life that starts now and endures for an eternity, but it's also about quality. We might think about it as, how do I inherit a life that is resilient and strong and good? That also goes forever. This is the question that, just a small question, right? Like the, one of the biggest questions you could have. But he stands up and he asks Jesus, and Jesus turns it back on. He's like, I see you're an expert in the law. What do you think it says? And the expert in the law, he gives this very common but right answer. He answers it rightly. The guy's right. He rattles off one of the greatest or the greatest command in Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the Shema. That's what's called the Shema. It comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. He knows it. And then he adds another one. And love your neighbor as yourself. He recites these. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The guy knocks it out of the park. Everybody knows this guy is an expert in the law. In fact, Jesus has given this answer at other places in Scripture. He was, he was likely asked this question again and again and again, being tested to see what kind of teacher, what quality he had. And he even answers it this way. He is approached in a very similar situation, and he gives this answer. And the person responds, that's, that's very good. And Jesus says this in and of itself, it sums up. If you could love God perfectly and love others well, that's everything Scripture is talking about. You've kept all the rest of the rules if you could do that. So the man gives the right answer. Jesus responds, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, this guy's starting to be exposed a little bit because Jesus ju doesn't just confirm or affirm his answer. He says, now go and do it. Well, the, scri the, the scribes, Pharisees, and the experts in the law, they all knew a lot about Scripture. Like, they could rattle it off. They knew it all. And Jesus says, no, no, go do it. Wait a second. Let's not get extreme. <laughs> Jesus, like, I get it. I, I know a lot. Like, he's, he's being exposed because he knows a lot. But he also realizes the moment Jesus says, now go do it, that there's a big gap between what he knows and how he lives. And so Jesus says, go do it. And the, the man, the expert in the law, he wants to justify himself in verse 29, so he, he picks up a side conversation. Whenever somebody can't do what they say they're going to do, they always find a little way out. Like, I'm really good at this, okay? I have been really good at it. It's the reason why I gave an answer. Like, I have five pairs of those pants. It's okay, right? So he goes to the side, the expert in the law goes to the side argument, because everybody knew you, you might be able to look like you're loving God on the outside. You can go through all the ritualistic worship, you can offer all the sacrifices that the Jewish law stipulated, but the people closest to you know that at least every once in a while you don't love others perfectly. And so he, he picks up this other argument of who is my neighbor. Let's pause because if I have to love God perfectly and love my neighbor, well, love God, that one's pretty clear. Love my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Like just the person on either side of my house? Okay, I got this. 
The argument actually went uh, that Jewish people considered Jewish people their neighbors. If you were an Israelite, you were the neighbor to another Israelite. If you were non-Israelite, you weren't considered the neighbor. Therefore, Israel had this thinking that if I love my neighbors, that just means the people that are like me. Right? Like, it's so easy to go there. If you're not Israelite, I don't have to love you. You have the judgment of God on you. And so, this expert in the law, he tries to draw Jesus into this kind of sidebar argument. He asks Jesus another question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes into this, what's known as a parable. It's a story that has an intent and a purpose. It's not just an illustration, it's meant to teach. In reply, in verse 30, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him for half dead. Uh, Jesus is a really good storyteller. He did not waste any time in going to the problem in the story, did he? He, like, he goes right there. He starts, and he, he starts this conversation with something that, even though it's not a true story, it has a lot of realism to it. There was a road that went from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was about 12 miles long, and it changed. Get this. If you walked this trail, it, you were covering about 3,000 feet in elevation along the 12 miles. Like, some of you are like, that's a fun hike. I'm like, that sounds like a day I should have stayed inside. <laughs> right? But this was the path from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a very real trail, and it was a a very rugged trail. It was very exposed, and everybody knew it was a great place for thieves and robbers to hide. And so all of this is wrapped in kind of a realism, even though it isn't a real story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, he's going from Jerusalem. There's a little bit of emphasis here on the nationality of the person. If you're from Jerusalem or Jericho, there's a really good chance you're you're Jewish, all right? There's a really good chance you are an Israelite by nationality, by practice of religion. So, that's who we have. And as he's along this 12-mile journey of 3,000 miles of elevation change, he's attacked by robbers. People didn't travel alone on these kind of roads because of this situation. Not just robbers and thieves, but the chance of being uh, exposed and and being uh, attacked by wild animals was, was a very real thing. But these robbers are waiting for him. They take his clothes, they beat him, and they leave, and when they leave him, he's half dead. They leave him for dead. They didn't kill him, but they knew he was as good as dead. Like, that's the idea. They took everything he had, he was exposed in the elements on a rugged road, and who knows who would come along? Well, the next part of the story tells us who comes along. We have this guy, Jewish man, who's half dead, and then we have a priest And a Levite, verse 31 and 32, a priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, uh, the people hearing this, especially, keep in mind, this is an expert in the law. He knows all the rituals. He knows all the customs. There is this thing about Jewish people in their worship practices that if they touched bodily fluid of any sort, they were disqualified from worshiping God in in ceremonial practice for a period of time. So, we have a priest who's a Jewish guy. We have a Levite who's priestly adjacent, okay? And they're on their way probably either having performed religious duties or going to perform religious duties. And they come across somebody who's bleeding and broken. Now, in the expert in the law's mind, when they pass on the other side, they did the truthfully right thing. Why? Because if they were to touch the person, they would have been unclean and unable to perform their priestly duties. So, they kind of hike up their robes, tiptoe around the edge, and just keep going, right? They get on their way. They don't want to come into contact with that because that would make them unclean. These guys are more concerned about being right and knowledgeable about the law than being loving and compassionate to somebody who's broken. That's the picture we have here. And by the very definition of what the expert in the law would have assumed a neighbor to be, these priests and Levites would have been the Jewish man's neighbor. They should have cared for him, but they don't. They were more concerned with their ritualistic worship and practices than they were with somebody who was broken and left on the side of the road. Now, 
we get into the climax of the story, the plot twist. A Samaritan, in verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he, was tra- as he traveled, came to where the man was, and he saw him and took pity on him. Now, uh, just a little context, Samaritans and people, uh, Jew- other Jewish people, they had blood feud going on. They had bad history with one another. They did not like each other. They believed sort of in the same God, but Samaritans were considered this kind of half-breed Israelite. They were unfaithful. They were impure just by their birth. And then on top of that, we have Jerusalem and Samaria, two distinct separate opposing places where each city believed that was the right place to worship God. So they had this argument going back and forth. Jerusalem is the right place to worship God. No, Samaria is the right place to worship God. No, Jerusalem is the right place to worship God. You know, if if you're having a hard time like wrapping your mind around it, just think about how people feel about churches today. No, this church is the right place to worship God. No, that place is the one where you're going to find God. We have that argument going on between these two people. So it's incredibly jarring when we read that the Samaritan is the one who stops and takes pity on him the one who would be considered not the neighbor, doesn't have to. He's probably free and clear. In fact, it might be expected, just finish the guy off. But he's the one who stops, and he has pity on him. And then this guy gives so sacrificially. Oh, my goodness. Like, I just want to go through a quick list of things that this guy gives of himself. First, he stops and has pity on him. That's time on a 12-mile road that's open and exposed. And from what we know of this story, he's alone. The same thing could be happening, could happen to him. If he delays, if he's slow, those robbers could be out there. This guy's not dead yet. He's just half dead. The robbers might be close by. He could be next, but he stops. He doesn't see it as a warning sign and hurry on his way. He stops. He gives him his time. And then he went on to him, verse 34, and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He gives of his possessions. He sacrificially gives. And like maybe the guy was carrying bandages, but it's probably more likely that he took some of his extra clothes and tore them apart to bind the wounds. And then he pours oil and wine. Wine had, uh, has alcohol in it. He did it to sterilize the wounds. It had medicinal properties. They believed uh, oil, to some extent, had medicinal properties as well. And on top of that, it preserved and helped sterilize the wound, kept it clean and and all of that, and it softened everything. So this guy did the best he could with all of his possessions to make sure this guy had every chance to live. And then on top of that, he doesn't just leave him thinking, you know what, he's going to rest up, he'll be good, he'll get on the path. He loads him up onto his own donkey, likely the donkey he was riding on the 12-mile journey. Now he has to hoof it himself, and he puts the guy on his own donkey, and he leads him to the inn, likely the inn, at the end of the trail where he was going to go. And when he gets to the inn, it says in verse 35, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Now, uh, culturally speaking, like we don't understand how much money that is. This guy takes out of his pocket and gives to the innkeeper enough uh, that, that scholars believe that it was one to two months worth of care for this guy and room and board. He provided enough month that this guy could stay in this inn for a month and a half with all the medicinal uh, needs that he would have, all the medical care that he would need, all the food he would need, all the attention he would need. So he gives sacrificially out out of his finances. And finally, he says, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense which you may have. There's two things here. Again, he's giving him his time beyond committing to even give more of his money. He leaves nothing off the table in how he's willing to treat this man in order to see him healed. So much so that he says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to check on him and I'm going to make sure he has everything he needs. So don't stop the care if if he's not done yet. Keep the care going and I'll pay you whatever you need. Jesus wraps up the story at this point. He looks at the the teacher of the law, and he doesn't answer the question, who's my neighbor? He says, which of these three men, or which of these three do you think was a neighbor? You see, it was an action thing. It wasn't a definition thing. It was an action thing. Which one do you think had care and compassion? Which one showed the heart of the Father to those who are hurting and broken? The Samaritan. 
That's why this is such a wildly popular story even outside of the church walls because it shows an important part of God's heart. Now, for the most part, we take this passage and we look at it as a story of how we should have love and care for others, and that's true. But I find it fascinating, the example of love and compassion that Jesus uses in this story. Jesus could have used the poor, but He didn't use the poor. Jesus could have used the marginalized, but Jesus didn't use the marginalized. He used somebody that for all practical purposes was a normal person walking down the path of everyday life and is assaulted and left bruised and hurting and battered. And he's not dead, but he's not far from it. Do you know what this is? This is a picture of every single person who walks the face of the earth. Scripture says that the enemy roams around the earth like a lion seeking to devour, that he comes to steal and kill and destroy. And while I think the church has gotten pretty good at attending to the physical needs of the world around us, we've kind of lost track of what it means to be a place of healing. There's a deeper thing. We've kind of just been co-opted into this narrative that it's okay, time will heal all wounds. Don't acknowledge it, just move on, you're going to be all right. You can be strong enough on your own. I promise you, here's a principle. If you can be strong enough on your own, you will be. The problem is, at that point, you don't get Jesus. Jesus is a very good gentleman. He doesn't go where he's not invited. He doesn't, he doesn't help with, which he, with the things he's not asked to help with. And the church has lost track of this. There's a guy who was born in 354 A.D. named St. Augustine. Saint isn't his first name, just heads up, like if you thought, <laughs> weird name to name your child. Augustine's not a whole lot better, but this is a guy that was in the early church, and he was a profound thinker and theologian and pastor. And when he read this passage, he didn't think about just the love and care that we individually send to one another or go out and perform. As Americans, we think about the story and we see the love and compassion and we think about what our role is out there, and that's true. That is true. But when St. Augustine read this passage, he saw a picture of who the church collectively was called to be. And he started thinking, he started thinking that you and I are not just individually these good Samaritans that are being sent by God to go and heal out there. That is true. I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with that. But St. Augustine also saw this collective picture that you aren't just the Samaritan, we are the Samaritan. And the inn isn't just some fabricated example of where this, this person on the path is, is brought to, it's a picture of the church that we are all the Samaritans and that we are all bringing people to the church that is a place of healing. This is what St. Augustine said, let us then be carried into the inn to be healed. When he talks about the inn, he's talking about the church. When he's talking about us, he's talking about every single person, every believer, because here's the truth. I think we've gotten so far off track with what the church is called to be that we have to experience some things ourselves. St. Augustine knew this. He knew that the inn is this picture where we have this truth. The church is a place of healing. The church is called to be a place of healing. God's calling our church to be a place of healing in this valley. 100%, I believe that to be true. God has called us to be a place of healing. But the reason St. Augustine draws our attention for us to be brought into the inn is because so many of us have just been hunkered down into this cultural viewpoint of our own trauma, our own hurt, our own pain, that we're just waiting for time to pass by, and eventually maybe things will get better. Guess what? If you don't pay your bills and you just leave them to pile up on the counter, they don't go away. The same is true with our hurt. And the same that's true with our hurt is the same that's true with other people's hurt. It doesn't just go away. 
And if the church is called to be a place of healing, St. Augustine is a prophetic voice to us right now that says, okay, if that's true, we have to go first. Don't worry about being the Samaritan. Worry about going to the inn first. You go to the inn. Let us be carried to the inn. We need healing. We cannot be a church that becomes a place of healing unless we ourselves are first healed. We were sitting with a group in our living room talking about this very concept recently. And one of the quotes out of a book we were reading by a guy named Rob Reamer, he says this, he said, you can only give what you have. If you don't have it, you can't give it. If all I have to offer the world are wounds that have been calloused over and at best I'm a numb place or just waiting for somebody to press on the wound, I have no healing to offer. If we're going to be a church and step into this place of healing, we, are first, we ourselves first have to go to the inn. We have to go through the journey of healing. How do we engage this 100%? We ourselves go on the journey of healing. We go through the process of healing. We choose to say, I'm not satisfied with just covering up the wounds or letting it go by until the sting and the pain of the wound is gone. We're going to hold out for whole healing. We live in a world where wholeness is the most coveted thing, and almost nobody has it. But here's the truth. Jesus has it. We live in a world where nobody wants to acknowledge sin, and guess what? That's okay with me. That's okay with me, because here's what I believe. Everybody's looking for wholeness, and along the way, they're willing to get rid of their sin for wholeness. I think we live in a world where the good news of Jesus is that He heals, not just forgives, but heals. not just glosses over, not just moves past, but actually makes you whole. I don't know anybody that's not looking for wholeness. There is not a more ripe time for us to step into the calling God has placed on us to be a place of healing than now in this moment. And I believe that no matter where you are, what you've paid attention to or not paid attention to in your story, God wants to and is willing to heal you. And every one of us, Every single person is able to take steps forward toward wholeness, toward healing. Now, it's not a quick journey. It's not a short thing. It's not a silver. There's no silver bullet here. But I want to give you three principles that we need to pay attention to in order to take steps forward in our healing, in order for us to become like Jesus envisioned us, a church that is a place of healing. The very first one is we have to pay attention to our own house. We have to acknowledge the state of our own house. Everyone can follow the path of healing in Jesus if they will acknowledge the state of their own house. And here's what I mean by that. Each of us is like a building. Like the church is this inn, but each of us also needs to consider ourselves like our own inn, like our own house of healing. And if we cannot acknowledge that we have a need for wholeness, then we will never receive wholeness. Some of us even grew up in the church, and we're like, but I know a lot about Jesus. I could, I, could, I could explain a whole theology of healing. That's great. Have you experienced healing? If Jesus, if God, Father, Son, and Spirit are the same yesterday, today, and forever, God is still leading us into wholeness and still providing healing for us today. Jesus said that he didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick. You know what that means? It means that Jesus came for those who are ready to openly acknowledge that they need a healer, that they have a need for wholeness, and they're ready to pursue him as the answer to their healing. None of us gets to go on a journey of healing until we acknowledge our need to clean out the house. There can be no filling, there can be no restoration without first emptying the house of all of that and inviting the presence of God to speak to it. We have to acknowledge our need for wholeness. I think at this point in the story, 
the expert of the law would be like, Jesus, I'm so far past all these other people, couldn't you give me something better? But the answer to, from Jesus is still the same because so many of us are in the same place as the Pharisees or the experts of the law. We know it all, but we haven't done any of it. Intellectually, we know the truth, but subjectively and experientially, we've trusted that time will heal all wounds and it just hasn't worked. We need to acknowledge the state of our own house. Is it in a place of needing restoration? Secondly, we need to find a healed guide. There's another time Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and He says, you guys are like blind guides leading the blind. That doesn't go well for the person being led. Right? They, they could fall into a pit. They could fall into all sorts of areas. We can't get to a state of healing without somebody who has been healed by Jesus that has gone through their own process of healing and restoration. It's true today, and the world more than ever needs guides who have been through the healing process. They need healed healers in Jesus' name. There's another nuance to this that I want you to grasp. Some of us haven't gotten to that place of healing yet because we've been trying to do it on our own. But here's the truth. You can't get to wholeness alone. You never will. No amount of effort will get you there. No amount of self-love, self-care is ever going to get you to wholeness. It will get you past the pain and the sting of the wound, but it won't get you to healing. Another reason you need a guide is because you need community around you. Healing happens in community. You know, look at the story. That man's going nowhere. He's left for dead. He doesn't heal on his own. It only happens within this context of community. He needed somebody to come alongside to bind up the wounds and said, I know how to do this. It's okay. Let's go forward. Now, if you're anything like me, you'd be listening right now and say, that's, that's great. I want a healed guide. Where do I get one? Like, for real, I want you to reach out to us. I want you to come and talk to us because we have dedicated ministries set for this sort of a thing. We have people in this congregation. We have leaders who have gone and done the work so that we can help others do the work. We want to help you do the work. I'm not saying go find your own God. I'm saying we, we have a path. We have a way forward to healing. It takes acknowledging, and, and then it takes coming forward and saying, I, I need one of those guides. I want wholeness, but I don't know how to get there. Finally, we need to hold on to this principle. Let healing take time. I love in the story how, how the Samaritan is willing to give so sacrificially so that healing can take its rightful course. This guy wasn't going to get better in a day. Uh, the, the Samaritan didn't go to the inn and say, hey, I got, a, I, got a, I got enough money for two days. If he's not better by then, well, then I guess that's on him. He gives enough, and then he says, I'll come back, and I will give even more if that wasn't enough. He wants this guy to have all the time for healing that he needs. I think some of us have entered into a process of healing. We expected it to happen overnight. We look at these miracles that happen in a moment, and I believe that God still heals physically in a moment. I, feel, I think He can make anything happen, but oftentimes when it comes to these interior wounds that we've accumulated over the decades, God allows a process to be working so that we can slowly and surely learn to trust Him and allow Him to redeem things. Redemption takes time. And I think some of us slow down and we stop asking for the healing because we're like, well, it hasn't happened yet. Sometimes that's because we, we don't know where to look because we don't have a guide. We don't have somebody to help us see what we can't see. We don't know somebody that knows the path forward that's willing to put us on their donkey and help us get to a place of healing. And then sometimes we've just stopped. We haven't allowed it to take the time that it needs to take. We think, if I'm not better soon, then I'm just not going to be better. And God says, if that's what you would like, okay. Healing takes time. Undoing the hurt inside us takes time. And I think sometimes we stop short and don't see how powerful God is. As I was preparing for this, Ephesians 3.20 came to mind. Ephesians 3.20 says this, 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is, work with, that is at work within us. God's power is at work within you, and he is able to do more than you are able to ask for. Did you catch that? Sometimes we stop asking because God's power is beyond our ability to ask for sometimes. We don't know what we should ask for. And so we stop asking, and God's like, no, I have so much more for you, but you just stopped asking. His power is so much more than not just that we can ask for, but then we can even imagine. We can't even imagine what God is capable of doing within us. Sometimes we think, God, I'm going to settle for a lesser level of wholeness because that's all I'm able right now to trust you for. I have news for you. God is able to do immeasurably more than that. That work that he's doing in you, he could do more. But God, I, I've gotten to this... I've gotten to this place of healing, yet God has more for you, immeasurably more. You can't, put a, you can't put a measurement on it. It's so much more. You've gotten to one level of healing, great. Your next level of healing is how much you're willing to sacrifice to let God know you and work in you. Your next level of wholeness is the next level of asking the Lord. But sometimes we stop. We gotta remember, it takes time. It's a process. It's just like peeling an onion. You're gonna get to one layer, and it's gonna sting your eyes, and it's gonna make you cry every single time. But then you need to peel the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer. That takes time. If we're gonna be a place of healing, we have to be people who are willing to do those things. Because we can't give to our community what we don't yet have. We want to help you get there. I do believe there's a time coming when people are going to flood to the presence of God because it's the only place where true wholeness can be found. I think it's going to be the most attractive quality about the church. We've got to get to the inn. Yeah, we've got to get to the inn. Let's get them to the inn, but let's make this a place of healing first, not a place where we just know about healing, but a place where we've encountered the presence of God and found healing in Him. Let's be committed to our own journeys first. Let's pray.